Today we are here at the Botanic Gardens at OSU and joining me is Dr. Eric Lepresti who's brought some of his research plants. And Dr. Lepresti, this is a new plant for me. It's San Verbena? The San Verbenas, yes. Tell this... me a little bit about these. Okay, this is a group of um, wildflowers that occurs mostly in the western U.S., Canada, and Mexico. They occur as far east as Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska, and then all the way to the coast in California. Okay, so they can handle those hot climates, right? They <laughs> love hot climates. There's a lot of these that are uh, native to both the Mojave and the Sonoran Desert. Okay, well, so looking at the leaves, they kind of look almost like succulents. Tell me a little bit about the variability of some of these species that we yeah, have. Yeah, so these grow in sand dunes across um, wherever sand dunes occur, coastal sand dunes, desert sand dunes, and so a lot of them uh, do end up with um, somewhat succulent leaves, uh, probably somewhat for water conservation. A lot of them end up with a kind of low growing habit where they creep across the sand dunes. Mm -hmm. And if we let these grow naturally, they'd spread really far out. Whereas there are a few uh, that grow kind of more erect and more bushy. Yeah, this one almost looks like an onion chai from yeah, a distance. Yeah, this is... Um, this is one of the species that grows on really odd soils. This grows on gypsum soils in okay. northern New Mexico. And gypsum soils often have plants that have these very tiny chive-like leaves. Uh -huh. Also, I was noticing some of them have very sticky leaves. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, a lot of them have sticky leaves, and that's a very common um, adaptation to sand in general. Um, and the sand actually forms a coating on the leaves. Um, and in the wild, they would be entirely covered with sand, and that probably protects them both from further um, windblown sand. So oh. you can imagine getting like sandblasted would be really bad for the, the plants in you know a really windy coastal uh -huh. or, or uh, desert dune environment. And it also protects them from herbivores because what wants to eat a <laughs> sandy <covered>. plant? <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about the soil type, too, because you said one was grown in gypsum, but yeah. I mean, these pots are not light they're to really unload. They're really heavy. <laughs> yeah, so these are, you know, their, their name makes sense. The sand verbenas, they grow in sandy soils. Almost every species grows in, you know, very sandy soils where not very much else could survive. And so when we grow them in the greenhouse, we use half play sand and half potting soil. I grow them in still water um, in raised beds where I put sand into the bed. So if you were really committed to it, you could grow them just about anywhere. Okay. Well, they're beautiful plants and I, they have a history too. Can you share a little bit about that history yeah. in the horticulture industry? Yeah. So these were very popular garden plants in the 1700s, 1800s, and the first few decades of the 20th century. And then for reasons that I don't know, their popularity waned. Um, and after World War II, they virtually were unavailable in the horticultural trade. Whereas in seed catalogs before that, you could find three, four, five, or even six species uh, of these available. Um, and they were, Darwin grew a couple species in his garden, Asa Gray, who many people consider sort of the foremost American botanist, grew them and studied them. And so they were really popular for a long time, and now they aren't. And <laughs> I think it's time for a resurgence of interest. Yeah, definitely. They have beautiful flowers that kind of come in a range of white and pink. Is that? Yeah, most of the species are um, are either uh, white flowered, um, which is pretty typical for things that are pollinated by moths, or pink flowered, um, which can be pollinated by a lot of other. Uh, an awful lot of pollinators in general. However, there are some yellow flowered species, some red flowered species, and some sort of almost purplish species as well. Well, Dr. Lepresti, I know you've got a graduate student who's working on the native species here, so I'm gonna go catch up with her and look at some of her plants as well. Awesome, thanks for having me. Thank you. Sierra, Hi. how are you? Great. Thanks for bringing these plants here. They're beautiful. Of course, they are, aren't so, they? So this is what you're studying primarily Western Oklahoma. Kind of what's the range of, what is yeah. the species too? Tell me that first. Yeah, Abronia fragrance is really widespread. So it occurs from most Northern te um, Mexico all the way up to Canada even. And throughout the majority of its range, it has white flowers like this. Uh -huh. And so uh, one of the common names is actually Snowball sand verbena for these big clusters of white flowers. Um, but what I'm studying is um, this population in 
western Oklahoma and northwest Texas that has pink flowers. Okay. So why why do they have pink? They're the same species, right? What's the yeah. difference there? Is it the soil or what is it? We had an undergrad, Natalie Demarest, look at soil and see if that has an effect on pink and white flowers. It doesn't seem to. Um, so I'm focusing on the pollination ecology okay. um, and evolution of, of these plants. And so our idea is that with these, the pink plants that are not only pink, but also have flowers open a little bit longer into the day, that they were butterfly or other daytime pollinated. Oh, okay. And we seem to be seeing that already. Okay, so the white ones attract those night pollinators, maybe, the yeah, moths and stuff. Yeah, Okay, and they're related to the four o'clocks that we know in the garden? Yes. And so they'll open and close at different times? Is that They're the same family, um, and so four o'clocks are aptly named for the flowers that open in the evening around four o'clock and are closed through most of the day. Right. So as you can see with these white flowers, they're all closed right now. Um, they're not open at all for daytime pollination. Um, but looking at a lot of these pink flowers, they are still open, and so they're receptive to daytime pollinators. Well, I know western Oklahoma can kind of be tricky with some plants, but this one looks beautiful. Maybe something that a homeowner might add to their landscape if they have that right soil. Yeah, they love sandy soil, so if you add them to a raised bed with sandy soil, or if you just have sandy soil where you're living in western Oklahoma, you'd be set. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing this, Sierra. Absolutely. We hope you enjoyed this video as part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on the OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion. Okay.